Hi there, and welcome to Axel Bank Reports History and Today, conversations with America's top nonfiction authors and why their books matter right now. I'm Evan Axelbank, and today we're going to speak with Neil Gabler, the author of Catching the Wind, Edward Kennedy and the Liberal Hour, 1932 to 1975. This is his sixth book. He studied Barbara Streisand. He studied Walt Disney. And now Teddy Kennedy. Thanks so much for being here, Mr. Gabler. Thank you so much for inviting me. Before we start our interview, I do want to invite listeners to our Patreon page to ask for your support in keeping the show going. Go to patreon.com slash History. We're going to donate part of your contributions to a charity for children's literacy. Okay, Ted Kennedy, a senator for 47 years. That makes him the fourth longest serving senator in history. The youngest Kennedy brother, Iraq War opponent, healthcare advocate, Chappaquiddick, his fight with Jimmy Carter, his crucial endorsement of Barack Obama in 2008. Much has been said, much has been written. When and why did you decide, Neil, that we need to say and write more? You say there are two Ted Kennedys, one we know and one we don't. Yes, well, let's start there. Um, you know, I didn't know when I started the book, and I, I, I never start a book with any prejudice, or at least to the best of my ability. Um, so I didn't write this book because I wanted to write a hagiography or that I wanted to demonize him. But I, I did have a sense from my preliminary research that the Ted Kennedy we saw publicly was not the entirety of Ted Kennedy. And that indeed was confirmed in the over 10 years that I researched this book. So one thing that I that, that motivated me was to penetrate this individual and to tell his story. It's a great story. Uh, you, you couldn't make this stuff up. I mean, it, you, if, if you really examine this life, two older brothers, both assassinated, both in public service, uh, the, the remaining brother you know, kind of being moving through through his life picking up, as he literally said, the fallen standard of, of his brothers. Uh, you know, a, a man now kind of bereft because his brothers are gone. Uh, that's, that's a very powerful, almost Shakespearean story. Although, as I say in the introduction to the book, uh, Ted Kennedy's life was, you know, part Shakespeare and part tabloid. Uh, and we all know that. So that was part of it. I thought there was a Ted Kennedy that I could reveal here. And, and the, the Ted Kennedy that we see publicly is a Ted Kennedy that's sort of glad handing, uh, you know, a, a full of, of bonhomie, loving retail politics. That is not necessarily an inaccurate portrayal of Ted Kennedy, but there was a dark Ted Kennedy, uh, a, a Ted Kennedy who you, know, you might call him a melancholy, uh, which is not a word that would often be attached to Ted Kennedy by most people who observed him. So that was part of it. But there's another part of it um, that in some ways is more important to me. And that is I never begin a book with a subject. That is, I didn't sit down, Evan, and say to myself, you know, I really want to write a book about Ted Kennedy. Any more than I said, I, I want to write a book about Walter Winchell or Walt Disney uh, to mention two of the subjects of earlier books. Uh, I always begin a book with a question that I want to explore. And in this case, the question that I wanted to explore was what happened to American liberalism? Because when Ted Kennedy entered the Senate late in 1962, his brother was president of the United States and liberalism was nearing what one might call its high watermark. Uh, the Great Society was probably the high watermark of modern American liberalism. In the course of that 47 year career that you referenced, liberalism, you know, not only declined, but it declined steeply. Why? What happened? And, and I thought the way to tell that story was to tell the story of America's preeminent liberal. And so this, is a, this book tells two stories. It tells the story of Ted Kennedy. And it's a full-scale biography of Ted Kennedy. And that's a great story. Well, biographers are often asked, did you like the guy you wrote about? I, always, I asked that question is, a lot, yeah. I, I, you know what my answer is? I like his life. Because <laughs> that's what I'm dealing with. Not him personally, but his life. And the second story that I'm telling is the story of American liberals. 
And, and I do have a question about that because I did, I was struck by the way you described that, which is um, liberalism in America was seen as the right thing to do. It's right yeah. to look out for your fellow man or woman. Um, and for whatever reason, as, as we can get into here in the book, that idea starts to erode. But exactly. um, l- let's go back to the end. Uh, sorry, well, <laughs> this is a tricky part of, of your book. Your book begins with the end. There are um, endless yes. descriptions of JFK's funeral, of Bobby Kennedy's funeral train. But this funeral, 2009, of Ted Kennedy, you say represented very much who he was. And I had not read a description of this funeral. I guess I lived through it, but maybe I was sleeping uh, that day or something like that. Um, and the way you put it, um, the way the way you describe this funeral is they came. You say yes. they came over and over again. 50,000 yep. people file past his body. There's a procession that watches him going through New England and watching the car go through. The most powerful people in America were there, people who achieved what he never did, which is become president. Mm-hmm. You say that this funeral procession was long and democratic, small d, small d democratic. Yes. Why do yes. we have to examine the funeral of Ted Kennedy to understand Ted Kennedy's life? Because that funeral, Evan, says so much about the man. You know, when we look at at John F. Kennedy's funeral, it was almost royalty. The the, uh, riderless horse, the caisson, the march, you know, down Pennsylvania Avenue. There there was a a sense of royalty about it. The might of the republic was on display. Exactly. And and a king had died. I mean, that's, that's the way that most Americans... I am old enough, though I was young, to remember that that funeral and to have watched it with my parents in the funeral procession. And you know, the 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 sense was, you know, that that you know, America had fallen, uh, not just not just a leader. And Robert Kennedy's funeral, though different, still had a, a kind of august sense about it. It was held at you know St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York. Uh, there was the the funeral train that echoed the funeral train of Abraham Lincoln when his body was taken back to Springfield. But Ted Kennedy's funeral was very different. And you, you use the word that I use in the book. It was democratic with a small d. Um, it was a little more ramshackle than those processions that we saw for John and Robert Kennedy. Uh, the church where it was held was not the kind of was not, you know, a a St. Patrick's Cathedral. It was actually a church in a, in a immigrant neighborhood, Um, a church that ministered to the poor and the needy. Um, That's where Ted Kennedy wanted his, and he planned all of this, that's where Ted Kennedy wanted his service to take place. And the, the, the way that people responded to it. It was different too. Now this, of course, he couldn't have planned, but there was a sense of sort of dignified grief when you deal with John Kennedy's funeral or Robert Kennedy's funeral. But there was something almost familial about the way that the mourners responded to Ted Kennedy, as if he was one of the family. Uh, And as I describe in that in that procession and in that that uh, observance in Boston, so many people after those 47 years in the Senate, so many people lining those streets had Ted Kennedy stories, had had stories about what Kennedy, what Ted Kennedy had done for them, or times they had seen him, times he had reached out to them. All of this gave it a different tenor than the funerals of. Jack and and of Bobby, and so I thought that funeral, uh, and that that the, the, and the and the various elements of that funeral, because there was a memorial service, which was very much like an Irish wake. There was no Irish wake for John Kennedy. There was no Irish wake for Bobby Kennedy, but there was an Irish wake for Ted Kennedy, with people coming up and telling humorous stories about him. Um, and then there was the the funeral service itself where Barack Obama delivered one of the main eulogy. And that service was very interesting because as I describe it in the book, so many of those who spoke there 
talk about Ted Kennedy's failings, not about his greatness, but about his fallibility, about all the things he did wrong. You didn't get that at, at John Kennedy's funeral. Or about yeah, his, okay, no. now let's talk about let's talk about what he did wrong. Right. Let's talk about what a what a what a failure he was in so many respects. And then finally, you know, there was the the graveside service in Washington at Arlington, where we got. Ted Kennedy, he, they read the letter that he had written to the Pope. Ted Kennedy's own sense of penance, his own sense of fallibility. You didn't get that at John Kennedy's funeral or Robert Kennedy's funeral. So I thought for all of these reasons, the democracy of it, the fallibility of the, of the, the man who was being mourned, and his own sense of, uh, his own plea for redemption, really, from the Pope, all of those things spoke to who this man was, and they informed the book. I think they informed the book. You said that the Kennedy drama is Shakespearean, that he yes. um, at one point was young, um, he was errant, he was irresponsible. Um, you, said, <laughs> <Totally>. <laughs> yeah, you said that uh, with his brothers gone, he was now called into service and forced to grow into King Henry to maintain yes. the family legacy. Um, nothing was expected, but destiny was imposed. Um, did he ever vocalize his ambition that way? Baking from our childhoods just sticks in the memory, doesn't it? We never set off on holiday without piles of Tupperware. And there'd always be Bakewell Slice, Flapjacks and tray baked scones in the boot. Do you not do that, Lisa? No. (laughs) Sadly, I do not stack uh, the Tupperware in the back of the car when we go off on holiday. Welcome to Small Ways to Live Well, a new podcast from the Simple Things magazine. Season two is a pick-me-up tonic that helps us make the shift from winter to spring. A six-week suggestion box full of things to note, notice and enjoy about the season. Search for Small Ways to Live Well on your podcast app. Well, it was thrust upon him. So I don't think he vocalised it. You know, he, he, he was Prince Hal who became King Henry. And, and he did understand that now this was thrust upon him, this kind of uh, legacy and this kind of burden, because while it was he, was, he was now meant to carry the legacy of his brothers. And he did, a, he did take that on, and he talked about it explicitly in a speech that is called, and I referenced this earlier, the Fallen Standard speech which he gave in Worcester, Massachusetts, uh, after Bobby Kennedy's death, several months after Bobby Kennedy's death. And he said, you know, I'm, I'm picking up the fallen standard, meaning the fallen standard of his brothers. So he understood that he now had this responsibility, that the expectation for the man of whom nothing was expected, basically, the youngest senator in the Senate, the Kennedy who was regarded as the dumbest of the Kennedys, uh, the, the least uh, complex of the Kennedys uh, was now in the position of being the last remaining Kennedy and the, the foremost of the Kennedys. But it was a burden because he had to carry on not only the political legacy of his brothers, but also the personal legacy. He became the paterfamilias of the Kennedy family. You know, he took Bobby Kennedy's 11 children and took them on basically as his own. And he did the same with John Kennedy's two children. And of course, he had three children of his, of his own. So, you know, that was another burden that people don't really address when they, when they look at the complexity of Ted Kennedy. And, and he was a complex man, a deeply complex man. Um, he had political burdens and he had personal burdens. And he knew he was, to answer, to get to the, your, the, the point of your question, he knew he had to assume those burdens. He knew it, and he did it. He is born Edward Moore Kennedy in 1932, and it's just occurring to me that this is a family of nicknames. Uh, I don't know why it didn't occur to me till now. I've read dozens and dozens of books about all of them, but you've got, uh, you've got Teddy, you've got Jack, or JFK, 
you've got Bobby or RFK. You have mm-hmm. Kick Kennedy, who was, of course, right. their sister, uh, whose name was birth name was Kathleen. Um, so where does Edward Moore Kennedy come from? Where does that name come from? And uh, well, we know where he came from, but the name, <laughs> the name I'm asking, uh, where did the name come from? And, and, and because there's such a fascinating story that goes along with it, what does that name, how it got there, foreshadow about his early years, at least symbolically? Well, Edward Moore, uh, who was, you know, the Edward Kennedy's, uh, who gave Edward Kennedy his name, was a factotum for Joe Kennedy, the father of the, the Kennedy clan. Uh, Edward Moore was like so many people who surrounded not only Joe Kennedy, but ultimately all, all the Kennedys. He was a sycophant. Uh, he almost never left Joe Kennedy's side. Uh, they were joined at the hip, but not because they were equals. They weren't equals at all. Uh, in fact, Joe Kennedy was the, was the ruler and Edward Moore was the servant. And the, the family very much, and Joe very much uh, trusted the loyalty of, of Edward Moore, uh, but also took tremendous advantage of Edward Moore, actually moved him and his wife, who are b- both of them were childless, uh, to a, a house right around the corner from his own. Why? Not because he had any great sense of brotherhood, but because he, he, whenever he needed him, he could just, <laughs> he would be there on the spot, Edward Moore. Now, the, the, the interesting thing about this is that, I mean, you have, you know, John Kennedy is named after his grandfather, and, you know, many of these are named after other luminaries in the Kennedy family, but Ted Kennedy is not named after a, a Kennedy luminary, quite the opposite. He's named after a, a Kennedy servant. And in some ways, that's, that's fitting for the role he played within that family. Ted Kennedy was literally an afterthought, literally an afterthought. They thought that their child having days and child rearing days, that is Joe and Rose Kennedy, were over. And he's born and 15 so, years. He's born 15 years after JFK and, yes, and I guess yes. eight, 17 or 18 after, after Joe Jr. Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, no one expected him to, to arrive because they thought, well, this is, we're finished. And I always love the story. They named their yacht, the 10 of us, because they never thought there was going to be an 11 of them. Uh, and all of a sudden, there, it, it turns out that, that Joe and Rose Kennedy were not um, really cohabitating, <laughs> but they had one tryst. <laughs> one tryst in this period, and that tryst led to Ted Kennedy. Yeah, and you even so have the is, place in the book. You even have like the place and the date in the book, which I thought was yes, funny. But go, when it yeah. happened. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so Ted so Kennedy te- arrives. Yeah, and the name Teddy, where does the nickname Teddy come from? Well, that that's, you know, I mean, Theodore, uh, you know, Teddy is, is often a name for that. But in the family, he had a different nickname. In the family, I mean, people called him Teddy. Uh, but he also had another nickname, and his nickname was Biscuits and Muffins, because in the Kennedy family, you know, everybody was supposed to be athletic and beautiful, and it was a very aesthetically driven family, and that was the the quest, frankly, of Rose. Rose was, though, though she's often regarded as a spiritual figure because she was so deeply religious and went to mass every single day. But, but let's scrape some of that away. I, I, I try and demystify some of, the, some of the Kennedy lore in this book. And one of the things I, I want to demystify uh, is Rose Kennedy. Because you see Rose Kennedy as being this deeply religious mother, doting mother, uh, someone who was absolutely devoted to her children. Yes, she was deeply religious, but how much of that religiosity was really a kind of aestheticism, the aesthetics of religious worship, uh, and how much was, was true spirituality is very difficult to, ter- to determine. And in terms of her devotion to her family, uh, this is a woman who was far more devoted to her trips to Europe and to getting, uh, you know, a, a, a beautiful, uh, you know, gowns than she was to taking care of her children. 
and really her her the the her bequest to those children was that they had to have their teeth brushed they had to be well dressed they had to be well mannered um, they had to be aesthetic objects and so you have ted who's kind of he eats too much he's overweight he's not a great athlete when he's young he's not a kennedy you know he's really not a kennedy in the mold of the family he's he's a kind of violation of the aesthetic principle and so he becomes biscuit and muffins the little fat little boy whose job it is basically is to entertain the family to be the family jester that's the function that ted kennedy serves in the family but i'll tell you this evan that function that he served in the family served him really well when he went to the senate because he wound up serving the same function in the senate and that really helped him in a in an institution where deference was required where the chemistry between and among senators was paramount he was able, because of the role he played in his own family, to transport those things to the Senate chamber. And he became a very well-liked senator, which led to him becoming a very effective senator. So give us some of the early facts and figures of his early years. Uh, the first thing I want to know is, um, was he old enough? Now, he's 15 years younger than JFK. Um, was he old enough to even watch these famous debates that the family had at the dinner table over world affairs and the to take part in the incredible competitions that the kennedy family was always involved in and yelling at each other but also golfing and 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 um playing sports at football and all these other things um i i have vivid um sort of uh, visualizations of the way the three oldest siblings would watch after um, uh, Rose, uh, Rosemary, um, right. and, and, and I, so, but he was so much younger. So is he taking part in this sort of sibling rivalry and the family sort of growing up together? I mean, 15 years younger suggests to me that by the time they're in college, he's barely even functional yet. Well, well John is much more of a father figure to Teddy than he is a, a fraternal figure. Yeah. And Bobby, the same thing. I mean, Bobby, I mean, the, the, the age difference there is seven years, but Bobby is still much more of a, of a kind of, uh, you know, father figure. And he does serve that function, particularly uh, during the war, uh, when Joe is absent quite a bit in the early part of the war. T Teddy does not participate in the, uh, the, the, the competitions that Joe imposed upon the family, the competitions around the dinner table where they would talk about current events. You know, Teddy was too young. He wasn't at that dinner table, frankly. He was shunted to a smaller table with, you know, the young ones. Um, so he wasn't part of that, nor did he have any real interest in it. You know, I, I talk in the book about the fact that, you know, they were driven to the other his, his siblings were driven to to read and to know what was going on in the world and to compete in all sorts of ways teddy was not like that i mean teddy was a very different kind of of child partly because of his age and because of his age you know less was expected of him there were much lower expectations for teddy than there were for for the other children and i have a quote that i think is very interesting in the that i found um, where Rose actually addresses this explicitly and says, you know, when you have the older children, you know, you, you feel that you have, to, you, you have to really give all of your energies to them and, you know, you're, you're really concerned with having them do their very best about everything. But then, you know, the younger kids come along. And of course, Ted was not only the younger kid, he was the youngest and several years after, you know, his sister Jean. And by that point, Rose says, you know, you're not really that much engaged anymore <laughs> you don't really want to put out that kind of effort anymore well this is the this is the world uh, the the family world in which ted kennedy grew up they weren't putting out much effort for ted kennedy you know ted kennedy wasn't expected to participate in all of these things you know ted kennedy was you know the the least of the kennedys the youngest of the kennedys and the least of the kennedys and you know the thing about this evan is he knew it he knew it 
You asked earlier whether he understood that he was now accepting the, the burden of the family. He did when he was you know, a senator. But if you ask that question about the young Ted Kennedy, did he know that he was the least of the Kennedys? That he was the afterthought? That he was Edward Moore? The Kennedy was named after the factotum? Yes, he knew. He knew. And that, that permeated his life. I don't think you can understand Ted Kennedy without understanding that Ted Kennedy had full recognition that he was the least of the Kennedys. And that he carried late into life. He says in his, in his autobiography, in his memoir, it's one of the most interesting lines in the entire book. It's a reasonably candid book. But this line is the kind of candor that you would never hear from a Kennedy. Never. Because Joe would have forbidden it. Old Joe, and that was, I knew I would never be the equal of my brothers. Now, Kennedys never thought they couldn't be the equal of anyone, including their siblings, but not Ted, not Ted. Ted didn't think he could ever be the equal of his brothers. And in many respects, he spent his life trying to undo that idea. One thing that's really different about EMK or Ted Kennedy is the era in which he's coming of age. JFK fights in World War II. Yes. He's already well into adulthood and his career in public service as the country is seeing this rising tide of civil rights. I mean, Kennedy comes back from the war in 40, uh, at 44 and he's already a national celebrity by the time the 50s start. Um, Teddy is only really becoming a young adult. I mean, he's born in 1932, so he's not even 20 years old until 1952. Um, he enlists in 1951. Uh, how is he shaped differently than his brother um, or brothers when it comes to politics and also civil rights, given his just inherently different view of history? Well, let's let's also talk about why he enlists. I just want to I don't want to leave that. Out, yeah, no, you know, please. Yeah, that, please. that on the table, because, you know, Ted Kennedy is booted out of Harvard uh, during his freshman year because uh, he has a, a classmate take a Spanish exam for him. And uh, it, it, it was the sloppiest <laughs> effort <laughs> at, at having uh, someone <laughs> boost your grade that may, <laughs> may be in the history of, uh, of grade boosting. Yeah. But the proctor uh, of the exam knew the guy who was taking the exam, who was delivering the exam for Ted Kennedy and immediately reported uh, both the, the young man and Ted Kennedy, and they were uh, booted out of school. And Ted Kennedy had several options, one of which was to go to Notre Dame. His father said, here are the things you can do. You can go to Notre Dame, you can you know, take time off. One of the options was to join the armed services. Now, to your point, and it's, a, and it's absolutely you know, appropriate, here two of his older brothers were war heroes. His older brother, Joe, died in the war in an explosion uh, of, uh, d during a, uh, a mission, a secret mission. You know, Jack was a war hero. Um, he became a national war hero, as you point out, because John Hersey wrote a, a piece in The New Yorker about his heroism, and he was a legitimate hero. This was not, you know, just publicity. I mean, he towed one of his uh, mates- In his mouth, TV. yeah, in his in, teeth. In his mouth. Yeah. Yeah. you know, through the water when that PT boat was split in two by a Japanese destroyer. Uh, Ted, you know, basically goes over to Europe and serves as a, uh, as a guard, you know, for dignitaries. And he plays football because he was a football player at Harvard. Uh, he plays football on an armed services team. So the distance, I just want to point out to the distance between the heroism of his brothers and Ted's you know, rather mundane experience in the armed services is yet another point that he certainly recognized uh, of the distance between what his brothers had accomplished and what he had accomplished. But, it, but, but to the point of, of his political upbringing, um, you know, John Kennedy uh, was aiming for the presidency almost from the point, or at least his father had aimed him for the presidency, to be more accurate about it, to the point where he run, from the point where he runs for Congress after his war heroism in 1946, and uh, so he, 
everything in his life and, and in his senatorial career as well, after he leaves Congress and runs for the Senate and wins, everything is geared toward how to maneuver to get to the presidency. And so when you talk about civil rights, for example, uh, John Kennedy was no great advocate of civil rights. Uh, you know, it, it wasn't anything that would advance his presidential ambitions. He was interested in advancing those presidential ambitions. And, and as a result, um, you know, he was somewhat uh, timorous when it came to any kind of issue that would, that would put him on the front lines and make him a target. His idea was not to be a target. His idea was to be out there and to, um, to do everything he could to satisfy the different wings of the Democratic Party and ultimately to gain that, that presidency. Ted, you know, comes of, of political age when his brother is already president and when there's a, a, a beginning of a kind of a ferment in America, civil rights is part of that. And, and Ted Kennedy, you know, John Kennedy embraces civil rights rather late in his life, although his life was not that long, unfortunately, but also in his presidency. And he doesn't deliver the speech that, that advances the Civil Rights Act, at that time, the Civil Rights Act of 1963, which would be passed as the Civil Rights Act of 1964, until the, the, the night of the day that George Wallace stands in the doorway of the University of Alabama to prevent African-American students from enrolling. And that night, that night, John Kennedy is so moved by that, that he gives the speech about civil rights and the Civil Rights Act. But that's fairly late, that's 1963, that's fairly late in, in his moral education. Ted Kennedy, just a few months later, during the March on Washington, which John and Bobby warned Ted not to attend the great March on Washington where Martin Luther King makes his I have a dream speech. And they said, don't, don't attend this because John and, and Bobby were both sort of keeping their distance. They were, they had embraced civil rights, but they understood the political consequences of doing so. John Kennedy had won the South in 1960. You know, he wasn't going to win the South in 1964, if he was too wholehearted in his embrace of civil rights. And already he had pretty much sacrificed that. But Ted Kennedy went to the march. He kind of, of hid himself among the crowd. He wasn't, it didn't say, here I am, the president's brother. But he did go to the march. And he said that it had a tremendous impact on him. And this is something else, Evan, that I think it's important to understand about the Kennedys generally and about Ted's relationship to it. We tend, I believe, to read John and Bobby into Ted and to say that you know, Ted is this preeminent liberal because he's you know, carrying that legacy that we've referred to several times of his brother. But in truth, Ted was the most liberal of the three Kennedys. And I believe there's another process at work here, which is we read Ted back into Bobby and John. And they, in retrospect, become much more liberal than they really were, particularly John. Bobby was transformed by, by his brother's death, and he did become you know, a, a prominent liberal and fought for liberal causes. But Ted was the most liberal because he devoted his entire life to liberalism. And it's because we think of Ted as being this liberal firebrand that we come to think of Bobby and Jack as being liberal firebrands too, which, which you know, Bobby came very late to that. It was only after Jack's death that Bobby came to that. And Jack was never a liberal firebrand, never. Let's go back, because I think this is really important, um, to how Teddy actually gets involved in politics. And I think in the, you know, in the Kennedy family, it's really fair to say that this really became their sport. I mean, it became their sort of, like, it became the way they became friends with each other, the way, you know, their relationships are defined by who's helping who get elected. And so, I mean, of course, you know, many of them were steered towards Jack because he was the one 
who took on the uh, older brother's mantle, uh, Joe Jr., who passed away in the war. Um, but the family goes to helping Jack and the sisters and the cousins and the female uh, relatives are hosting teas and coffees for him. And they're hosting Jack and they're kind of showing him off as this handsome guy who can tell a good story about how he's a gold star. Uh, his mother's a gold star uh, mother, just the way you all are. And they kind of take part in this retail politics. But Teddy goes behind the scenes. Teddy is the one wrangling votes along with Bobby, um, but especially, you know, himself just going through the, the far West, getting as many people to support his brother as he possibly can. You, I believe you said, yes, he was the vote wrangler um, during yeah, the 1960 campaign. So just talk about what lessons he's learning that would help him become a senator, an effective senator later on. Well, Jack, asks uh, Ted what part of the country he wants to be responsible for in the great 1960 campaign. And, and Ted is interested in the West because, and again, this speaks to all the things we've been saying about Ted and his own sense of fallibility. He knows that if he stays in Massachusetts, he's going to be compared to his brother. That's, that's inevitable. So he's already thinking about how can he stake out a political career of his own. Now, it was understood that there was going to be a political career because that's the family business. <laughs> you, know, you talk about the family sport. It's the family yeah. sport, but it's also the family business. You got to make business. dad happy. You're, you're, yeah, got to make dad happy. Dad wants, you know, he wants a Catholic president, first of all, because that's a big, big deal for right. Joe Kennedy. Right. Joe Kennedy felt that he had been uh, humiliated, uh, condescended to uh, all of his life because he was an Irish Catholic. And his revenge was, but my son's going to be president of the United States. So there. <laughs> Screw anybody who has ever disdained me because my son, not only one of my sons, but maybe, you know, of the, uh, uh, all three of my, right. you know, surviving right. sons will right. be president of the United States. So there was that. And, and, and so Ted takes the West and Ted goes through the West. And he goes from town to town, small town to small town in New Mexico and Utah and Colorado. Uh, he and Byron Wizard White, who, who was a good close friend of John Kennedy's and later, of course, becomes a Supreme Court justice, go walking all around and flying all around Colorado together, you know, talking to local precinct leaders and, and you know, Democratic leaders in small towns and whatever. And, and Ted gets a political education. Ted receives this political education, which in point of fact, his brothers really didn't have. I mean, Teddy was a vote wrangler. There's no, uh, uh, excuse me, Bobby was a, a vote wrangler. There's no question about that. But Bobby was, Bobby was the guy who, who kind of, you know, used the stick rather than the carrot. You know, he, he was not a guy who liked retail politics. He hated retail politics. In point of fact, so did John. So he was a guy who would go around and, you know, he, he, was, the, he was the arm twister. But Teddy was never an arm twister. And that is something that really did inform his political operation. Because Teddy was a guy who did like to slap you on the back. And he was a guy who did like to listen to what you were saying. He was a listener rather than a talker. And he was a guy who never intimidated, never. And, and you, you put all of those things together. Now, Jack Kennedy was going to lose the West. There was no question about that, which is one of the reasons he, he, he let, Kennedy, let Teddy take the West. Because, you know, he said, if Teddy screws up, and Teddy was a screw up, he got kicked out of Harvard. You know? <laughs> so, so let's, you know, Teddy was, just, so if Teddy screws up, it's okay, I'm not going to win that anyway. You know, Nixon's going to take the West, <laughs> not me. So, okay. But, but Teddy learned a lot uh, about that. And you know, we also worked on the 1958 campaign as well, the senatorial campaign. Uh, and, he, and he just got a feeling for people and how people operate. And it was something that really stood him in good stead when he ran for office himself. Um, and also when he went into the Senate and again was, you know, as I said earlier, was, was working the chemistry of the Senate, was working you know, how people, what people wanted and how people wanted to be treated. Ted was great at that. You know, his, his father said, and Jack said the same thing. They all said this. He's the best politician in the family. 
And, and by that, they meant not the guy who's going to win the easiest. Jack was the guy who, who won the easiest. But he was the best politician because he understood people the best. That was actually uh, something that he inherited from his grandfather, Fitzgerald, who rose his father, who had been a congressman and the mayor of Boston, and who was just a, would sing Sweet Adeline at the drop of a hat and was very much in the, in the, in the mold of an Irish Catholic politician. And Ted, in many respects, much to his family's chagrin, was much more a Fitzgerald than he was a Kennedy. Hmm. Kennedys were rigid. Fitzgeralds were wild. Ted was much more Fitzgerald. His brother is president. Um, Teddy basically says, I want to do something in arms control. And Jack is like, <laughs> I love this scene in the book. Jack is basically <laughs> like, what are you, nuts? you got to start traveling Massachusetts. You're not going to go there. Everyone's going to forget about you. Um, let's talk about when he starts to get this idea that he could be a senator also. Well, that, of course, was an idea that was planted in his head by his father. <clears throat> and his father, as, when the election's over, the 1960 presidential election, and, and you know, Jack is obviously president, Bobby becomes attorney general, and Joe says, you know, you know says literally, he says, okay, you boys have yours. You're president, you're attorney general. What about Teddy? We have no time Teddy? to waste. There's no time yeah. to waste here. There's no what time to waste there? here. Come on. What, what about him? What are you going to do for him? And, you know, it's an embarrassment <laughs> for the president that his 30-year-old brother, who has never held elective office, and the most important thing he's done is a job that Joe Kennedy gets for him as an assistant district attorney in Suffolk County in Boston. All right, we're that's, doing that's, DUI cases, right? Yeah. That's right. Yes. His first case is, you know, he's, he's dealing with, you know, somebody who's driving while intoxicated. You know, I mean, this is the kind of stuff you do uh, when you're an assistant DA. But this 30 year old who's an assistant DA is already, you know, thinking because his father has prompted him to think that you're in the succession. And in the Kennedy succession, you're going to be senator. Now, I, even Ted, even Ted thought it was sort of ludicrous. I mean, <laughs> Ted was ambitious, but, you know, he, he kind of understood that, you know, aiming for senator at this point was a little nuts. But, but you know, his, but Joe Kennedy said, no, you don't do anything less. You're the governor or senator. You know, what are you going to do? No, that's what you're going to do. So Ted is kind of, of propelled into this idea that he's going to be He's going to replace his brother. It's, it's, it's John's vacated seat. So he's running in 1962 for the last two years of John Kennedy's term. The last two years that, that John wasn't going to serve because he was president. And, and so Teddy runs for the Senate, even though, again, he has no, no qualifications for it, which, of course, his opponent in the uh, he, had a, he had a Democratic opponent. Uh, in the primary season, and that was the nephew of the House Majority Leader, John McCormick. So here you have these two great dynasties up against one another, the McCormicks against the Kennedys. And how does he sort of hone this liberalism that you were talking about during this campaign? I mean, some of it comes through in the personal stories that you're telling in the book about how um, he he wins the hearts and minds of these factory workers, even though neither he nor anybody else he probably knows had ever been inside of a factory before. Um, how does he hone this common touch and this idea that there are people out there who need help during this campaign? A lot of this comes from that grandfather Fitzgerald, you know, that I talked about just a few moments ago. Because when, when Teddy was in high school, uh, he, he would, he, and he went to boarding school, he would go into Boston to spend his Sundays with his grandfather Fitzgerald. And grandfather Fitzgerald, who I said was an old-fashioned backslapping politician, would take Teddy around Boston. And he would take him, he'd go to the hotels and he'd go into the kitchens. And he'd greet the people in the, in the kitchen. Uh, and he'd walk down the street and he'd say hi to people and stop to talk to people and, and hear their stories. And Teddy observed all of these things. And, you know, if, if Teddy got his 
political bug from Joe Kennedy and from his brothers, he got his empathy from his grandfather. And, and what he understood, part of, which, part of this, of course, is, is you know, embedded in him by being the least of the Kennedys. But he understood what it was like to be the least. He understood what it was like to be the person for whom, uh, of whom nothing was expected. And so this, this translated itself into a kind of, of common man touch that John and Bobby did not have. You know, as I said earlier, John and Bobby hated retail politics. Bobby at one point said to, to uh, Lawrence O'Brien, who was, uh, you know, one of the, the major operatives in, in John Kenney's campaign, later became postmaster general. Uh, he said, how can you guys stand this? I don't like being touched. You know, a politician doesn't like being touched. And it's funny because Bobby Kennedy was about the most touched politician in, in, you know, in, in our modern in history. history yeah. Everybody wanted to touch him, but he couldn't stand it. Ted, Ted loved being touched. Ted loved reaching out and having people grab him, and he just loved it. And, and that, that's, I, again, I think it, 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 it comes from Ted's own sense of his own deficiencies, his own deficiencies that connected him connected him with common people who also felt deficient, socially deficient. How did the deaths of his two brothers, JFK in 63, RFK in 68, reorient Teddy's life politically and personally? Well, you know, Bobby's had much deeper effect on him because he was much closer to Bobby than he was to Jack. I mean, he loved Jack. And, and oddly enough, Jack loved him. And I say oddly enough, because we always think of the relationship between Bobby and Jack as being so tight. So, and it was, but, you know, I quote someone in the book as saying, you know, you, you, basically I'm paraphrasing here, but you know, Jack couldn't have any fun with Bobby. <laughs> you know, it's, it's just, Bobby was just no fun, but Ted, Jack loved Ted and got off on Ted's energy and, and lived vicariously through Ted, both physically because Kennedy, John Kennedy had a lot of infirmities physically, and Ted had none, uh, but also loved his kind of hedonism. Now, Jack was something of hedonist himself, but, but he just loved the recklessness with which Ted could bull his way through life. But when Bobby died, Ted had become very close to Bobby after Jack's death. They, these were two bereft brothers who found one another and when Bobby entered the Senate in 1964, the junior of the two Kennedy senators, they had a, a very strong bond there. And when Bobby died, Ted was as devastated as Bobby was when Jack died, which is to say that he could barely function. We think of the Kennedys as being stoic. We think of them as being resilient. We think of them as being, yes, they face all this tragedy and they keep moving forward. But that's not true. That's not true. That's one of the things where I said when, when, you, when you look at, at the public Ted Kennedy and he's you know, moving onward, moving on, even after all this tragedy that envelopes him. But no, he had a really hard time moving on. And initially, he ceased to function in the same way that Bobby ceased to function after Jack's death. But that put the burden after Jack's death on Ted. Ted had to assume that burden because Bobby couldn't function. And, it, and, and slowly, slowly Bobby was able to restore himself. When, when Bobby died, Ted was also devastated and also slowly restored himself. But when he came back to the Senate, and I think this is what you were referring to, Evan, when he came back to the Senate, he was an absolute dynamo. Uh, and he was a dynamo because Bobby had left unfinished business. There were all these things that Bobby had assumed after Jack's death, all the people he wanted to help. And that was gone. And now Teddy had to do those things for Bobby, for Bobby, for Bobby. We can't talk about Ted Kennedy without talking about perhaps the most famous car crash in American history. Yeah. 
Um, Chappaquiddick happens in 1969. Um, much has been said. I asked you before what has been said about what has not been said about Ted Kennedy that needed to be said that needed to be said with, and that's you know why you wrote your book. Um, what did you learn about Chappaquiddick that no one else has, or what conclusions have you been able to draw that are fresh and new? Well, I particularly did not name a chapter Chappaquiddick because I, I knew that that's the first thing that everybody would turn to in the book. Uh, but my interpretation of what happened is very different than the interpretations both at the time and subsequently. And, you know, I've read every book. There are, there are at least a dozen books on Chappaquiddick. I've read every single one. You know, I've gone through the inquest uh, transcripts in great detail. I've read every post-mortem, and there have been a dozen post-mortems on, on the Chappaquiddick accident by the New York Times, by the Boston Globe, by the LA Times, by Reader's Digest, by the Washington Post. You know, so you go through all of these things. And you come up, in my estimation, if you're honest about it, with a very different view of this event than is the, the conventional view. And in some, without relitigating it altogether, if people are interested, you know, they can read the chapter. Uh, it's a chapter, you know, I, I, I was very cautious with this chapter because I realized that if I give him any excuse, I'm going to be called an apologist. Uh, I knew that. Uh, on the other hand, it, you know, if I, you know, just kind of batter him, which is the standard way of doing things, I would be dishonest. Because here's the thing, Evan, that you got to come. You, there's, it's, it's inescapable conclusion. He did not murder this woman. <laughs> I mean, you know, you, you, you look back at this and you say, well, he murdered her. And there are some books that say he did. You know, ridiculous, ridiculous, you know, uh, uh, in, in, in analyses. You know, he had an accident. No one who is honest, in, in, in the least bit honest, could say anything other than this was an accident. Now, consequences follow from that. His behavior was inexcusable. You know who said that, that his behavior was inexcusable? He said it. He said it. You can read dozens of, of accounts, as I said, and they'll talk about there are these discrepancies and these lies and these uh, conspiracies. What's the conspiracy? I mean, let, let's, no, let's, let's, let's just clear it away. Conspiring to do what? What was the conspiracy? To, to say that he didn't, you know, have the accident? I don't see that anywhere. He, you know, he didn't particularly behave particularly well when he didn't report the accident. Uh, there are reasons he gave for that. And though they're not excuses, they're, they're plausible. And the plausible reason that he said and, I, and this is absolutely plausible. This from a man who had fielded these sorts of telephone calls in the past for his own family was, I couldn't bring myself to pick up the phone and call the Kopechnys and tell them that their daughter was dead. Now, that's a lie. That's a conspiracy. That's a what? No, that's absolutely, totally plausible. It's not honorable. <laughs> I don't say it's honorable. It's cowardly. Because when you're in participating in an accident like that, that is your obligation, is to pick up that phone. But in the final analysis, this is a, a matter of Occam's razor. You know, the, the most obvious explanation is the explanation. He drove off a bridge. A young woman died. Uh, you can try and load all sorts of interpretations on that, that what were they doing and whatever. But you know what? That impugns Mary Jo Kopechny, not just Ted Kennedy. And as I explain in the book, at some length, Mary Jo Kopechny was not going to have a tryst with Ted Kennedy. She was a deeply, deeply religious young woman who was not about to go off with Ted Kennedy to have some romance with him. So let's, let's just, you know, cut to the chase. What Ted did was inexcusable in terms of not reporting the accident. It was an accident. He didn't murder anybody. The discrepancies, I've gone over these so-called discrepancies, they're all minor, minor nothings, minor nothings. 
the New York Times had a big story some 10 years later or whatever uh, about you know how there were phone records that had been purged and whatever, but there's no evidence even that he was the one on the phone. <clears throat> Other associates of his were using his phone credit card. You know, he, when you, when, again, it's everybody wants some big, big conspiracy, but sometimes stupid things, awful things happen and there's no big conspiracy. It's just an awful thing that happened sometimes because of the stupidity of, of the people involved or whatever. In this case, Ted Kennedy, I don't know whether it was stupid or not, whatever, but, but you, there's just no, no, they're there. That's, that's the issue. Uh, you mentioned um, the unfinished business um, of Bobby and we've been talking about, or at the beginning we talked about how um, Ted Kennedy represents the hopes and dreams of liberal America and that liberal America um, starts to wane as the 60s and 70s come to a close and Ted Kennedy is sort of trying to catch this wind and your book ends in 1975. Um, but I did want to run through the legislative accomplishments accomplishments just so we get a feel here of, of the thesis of your book as to why liberalism waned and how Ted Kennedy represents um, this sort of waving flag here. Um, I'm going to run through a couple of them. The 65... Um, uh, the the 65 v uh, Voting Rights Act, the 1991 uh, right to sue for discrimination, uh, yes. CHIP, ADA, Meals on Wheels, 700 bills became law that um, that he was deeply involved in. How did he learn how not only to have beliefs, but the ability to make them law? Those are two different issues, and let and, and I'll try and be as concise as I can. You know, one of the things that's scarce in politics today, if existent at all, is morality. And this is a book about morality. That's what this book is about. Ted Kennedy believed deeply in morality. I'm not talking personal morality now, because his personal morality, as we just talked about in Chappaquiddick, was one of those things that undermined the liberal enterprise. And Republicans jumped on this idea that if you were personally immoral, that that completely undermined your political morality. They love that conflation. Ted Kennedy you know, killed a girl on Chappaquiddick, therefore he has forfeited any right to his public and political morality. It's ridiculous. Ted Kennedy believed in public and political morality. As a line I always love uh, that Richard Reeves after Kennedy died said, he, he called him a publicly moral man. I think that's absolutely true. And he believed this country had certain, had, had certain obligations. And those obligations were to help the poor, to give voice to the voiceless, to give power to the powerless, to centralize the marginalized. He believed in those things. Those are all good things. We don't believe in them too much today but they were the very centerpiece of what liberalism was, the very centerpiece. Now, that I think answers your question is what drove him. He was driven to do the right thing, something we never hear about in politics today. The other thing is how did he do these things? That's a complicated process. In volume two, I talk much more about it, Evan, than I do in volume one. But one of the ways he did these things is when he used moral authority, he understood its power. And in those days it had power, even with Republicans, especially with Republicans because Kennedy introduced over 2,500 bills, as you said, passed 700 of them into law. And I don't think there's a single one of those bills for which he didn't have a Republican co-sponsor. Because one of the first things he always said when he sat down with his staff is, find me a Republican. And he knew how to reach across the aisle. And he knew how to bring people in. And he knew what people wanted, not in the way Lyndon Johnson did, to twist their arms or to give them something, you know, uh, that, that would politically help them. But Kennedy understood, what, what is it that you're after? What, what is the moral element of this if you can find it? And, and it was that quality of his, the sincerity of him, 
he was a deeply sincere man. The, the honesty of him, you'll find one Republican after another who said of Ted Kennedy, you can trust him completely. He never lied to you and he never double crossed you. Now we had many, many, many faults. I do not want to minimize his, his flaws. We haven't really talked a great deal about his flaws, but one of the flaws that he did not have was he was honest, he was trustworthy, and he he wasn't there to be as as so many worried when he first entered the, at the Senate. They said, oh, he's going to be a show horse. No, Ted Kennedy was a workhorse. He wanted to get legislation passed, and the way to do that was to bring people in, and also the way to do that. This, I think, is very relevant to what's going to be going on in politics in, in the next few months, if there are any Republicans who will reach across the aisle on the other side, which is that he was always willing to accept half a, half a loaf if he knew he couldn't get a hold. And he would never walk away from something because he couldn't get the perfect. The perfect was always, in the old cliche, the perfect was the enemy of the good. And Ted Kennedy used to, you, that was one of his mantras. The perfect is the enemy of good. Let's see what we can get. Because Ted Kennedy believed once you get your foot in the door, you can get that door open. So let's let's yank the door open, but let's get our foot in the door. Your book goes to 1975. And the best news of all is I often, in my reading habit, have to wait years and years and years for volumes twos and threes and fours and fives. And I'm busy waiting for volume five of Robert Caro's uh, legendary biography of LBJ. But the good news is that this book um, is already done. Volume two is already finished, apparently. So that's I've great. It. Uh, that's beautiful. What can we expect in volume two? Um, and if this one is called Catching the Wind, the second one has a different title and it kind of plays on the first yes. one. Explain that. Well, this one is Catching the Wind and it, and it means obviously catching the liberal wind of the great society and before that of the Kennedy years. And Ted trying to ride that liberal wind uh, when all of these great pieces of legislation, some of which you mentioned, the Civil Rights Act of 64, the Voting Rights Act of 65, the War on Poverty, uh, Medicare, all of these things, you know, it, that, that they're, they're carried by the wind of liberalism. Volume two is called Against the Wind, and it's subtitled Edward Kennedy and the Rise of Conservatism. And it tells the story of how after riding the wind, Ted Kennedy now is going to be facing into the wind. The conservatism, you know, attempts to stop everything that Kennedy and liberalism sought to do. It's the end of government activism. It's the end, quite frankly, if I, if I can be very blunt about it, it's the end of big hearted America. Well, we're certainly hoping that you'll join us for a, a second discussion once volume two is, uh, is out and about. I'd love to. Um, I want to ask about a personal story. Uh, before we started recording, you told me something incredible that you were in the room for um, uh, the moment when Bobby Kennedy was shot and killed in, I was. Uh, in, in the hotel. I was. And uh, I want to ask, um, you know, you don't have to describe the whole thing, um, uh, but I want to ask, how being a part of that experience may have in some way driven you to tell part of the Kennedy story? That, that's a very interesting question because, you know, as I said earlier, right at the outset, you know, I, I try not to, to come to a book with prejudices. And I didn't come to this book saying, I love Ted Kennedy. I can't wait to write about him. I was interested in the Kennedys. Uh, I was interested in the Kennedys for the very reasons that we have discussed in, in, in our time together. Um, that I do have some admiration, particularly for Bobby, who I had tremendous admiration for, of people who devote their lives to those who need their help, but they get no benefit politically. What was the benefit for either Bobby or for Ted, for that matter, politically? There was no benefit. They were going to be Ted was going to be elected to the Senate repeatedly, except for 1994, when he was when Mitt Romney was his opponent. And I tell that story in volume two. But you do it because it's right. And, and that was something that attracted me to Bobby Kennedy. Uh, and it did attract me to Ted Kennedy, although, again, I, I, I always try and, and follow the story where it, where it leads. I don't try and direct that lead. 
And I tell the story of Ted Kennedy, warts and all. And he's not, there are many, many things about him that are not admirable. But in the case of, of, of Bobby Kennedy, um, you know, I was working uh, as a, I was just finished my freshman year of college and I was working in his campaign. Uh, and I worked all the, all the way across the country with a couple of friends. We drove across the country and ended in Los Angeles because of the California primary. And, you know, we were in that room, as I said, at the Ambassador Hotel when he was shot. Uh, that, that episode had, had a tremendous impact on me. Um, in some ways, it had <clears throat> part of the impact it had on me was very similar to the impact it had on Ted Kennedy. When Bobby was shot, Ted said, uh, basically, uh, in so many words, it's all over. You know, it's just over. Now, I said that he, he regained his strength and he came back to fight for, Teddy, for, for Bobby's causes, but he was always, he always felt Ted Kennedy was a, a, a personal fatalist. And he thought, if I run for the presidency, I'll be the third Kennedy brother to die. He was a political optimist and a, and a personal fatalist. But, but I remember having that same feeling that day as, I was, as they herded us outside the hotel and we were on the sidewalk. And we didn't know what the situation was exactly. We'd heard that, that Bobby Kennedy had been shot. We didn't know how seriously he'd been shot. We were all basically praying. Um, but, but I felt, God, this moment, this moment, and I remember even now so vividly, this is the end. I mean, you, you, you can't have this man who wanted so desperately to save the soul of America. That's why he ran that campaign. You read that speech, and I quote it in my, in my book, when he launched his campaign, basically it was, we're fighting for the moral leadership of America. That's what we're about, the moral leadership. And I thought, well, the moral leadership is gone. And, and I'm certain uh, at, at not only a conscious level, but a deeply unconscious level, but a powerful one, that, that, was, that that's been with me throughout my, my life. And so to, to answer your question, I wanted to write a book about liberalism but I also wanted to write a book about political morality. I didn't know when I started this book 10 years ago that it was going to be as salient as it is now in a country that's basically devoid of political morality. But I think that was the motive force behind this book. That's what this book, look, you want to read a book about political morality. I'm not trying to sell the book. This is the book. This is the book. That's why I wrote it. Neil Gabler, author of Catching the Wind, Edward Kennedy and the Liberal Hour, 1932 to 1975. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Certainly check out that book and his others on Walt Disney and Barbara Streisand. I do, don't want, I do want to invite listeners to our Patreon page to ask for your support in keeping the show going. Go to patreon.com slash History. We're going to donate part of your contributions to a charity for children's literacy. And thank you for listening to Axel Bank Reports, History, and Today, conversations with America's top nonfiction authors and why their books matter right now. Be sure to check us out on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Axel Bank History. We're going to update those with clips from the show, guest announcements, and book recommendations. We'll see you next time. Thanks. Thanks.